Hello and welcome to episode number 260 of the Armin Show podcast. I keep track of the numbers because it's entertaining. On this episode, we have here our guest, Claire Bidwell Smith, therapist, author, grief expert. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is a wonderful thing. Now tell us this grief, skills, therapy, why this category? Everybody goes into a different category in their lifetime. Why did you pick this category? I have an idea based on your book, but you tell us. I went through um, a lot of personal loss early on in my life. Uh, Both of my parents got cancer and died um, when I was a teenager and in my early 20s. And I'm an only child. And so lost my whole immediate family pretty early on into life and was very difficult for a number of years. And then when I began to come through it, I started to work in this field. I got my master's in clinical psychology and then worked in hospice for a number of years and then in private practice. Um, And I was a writer before all of that. So writing was kind of my way of moving through it and coping. And um, I've now written three books about grief and loss. So This is true. Now, as far as that, I always like to check that when there's a progression of the books, if you wrote chapters of a book where each chapter was one of your books, what are these books, uh, how are they progressing? They definitely have a, a progression. The first one is my story. So it's a kind of literary memoir. It's called The Rules of Inheritance. And it really just traces my journey coming of age through all of that grief and loss. Um, the second book is called After This, When Life is Over, Where Do We Go? And that one is about how looking at different viewpoints about the afterlife affect our grief process. And I was doing that both for myself and my clients. I was seeing that a lot of my clients after they had lost somebody were really becoming curious um, about exploring where their person had gone, either through framework that they already had religiously or spiritually, or you know, looking into new territory. Um, and I also found it helpful in terms of kind of contextualizing my own losses. Um, So I did not figure out what happens when we die, spoiler alert, but I figured out a lot of things along the way um, and a lot of really useful um, developments for grief um, in terms of how we process our thoughts about the afterlife. And then the most recent book is called Anxiety, the Missing Stage of Grief. And that one is really based on my 10 years of of working one-on-one with clients and seeing anxiety as a really big manifestation of grief that was not recognized. Now, you had... Both of your parents were attacked by what is known as cancer and that affected them and affected you very early on in your life. This is obviously a big shift. These things shape our personality, the timings of what happens to us in our existence. Are you now tougher than all other people or most other people? (laughs) No, I would say I'm probably more vulnerable. (laughs) Um, I think I'm resilient for sure. Um, I think that resilience has has been something I've cultivated and, and had inherently that we all do in some in some ways. But um, I think the way I've kind of gotten through all of this is to be vulnerable, is to lean into it, is to let these experiences kind of break me open and shape me and teach me. One thing that comes to mind is you have many offspring of the multiple variety <laughs> up in the I five do. region. Now, what are you... What, what is the direct transference of that early occurrence in your life from you to them? Psychologically, do you, that you mean? Like, how, how are they, have they been impacted by my, my journey, my losses? Um, I think that my losses have informed me as a parent to be very present and, you know, really strive to create a meaningful life. I'm also a little wild and spur of the moment, and I'm always up for adventure. Clearly, I have so many children and pets and all kinds of things that I'm kind of up for all the chaos. So I think they've enjoyed not living um, with a lot of structure and rules and some chaos and a lot of traveling and just um, adventures and doing things on a whim. So I think it's uh, hopefully filtered down in some positive ways in that aspect. There's some variety coming to the forefront from this. (laughs) That's a cool feature. Now, I like variety a lot, by the way. I have to put that in spontaneity and variety and risk-taking and things that are not the thing you did the day before, kind of. Mm -hmm. So now, separate from that, you are a grief counselor slash therapist. 
what are some of the things you commonly do as that? I mostly talk with people one-on-one -on -one, um, following a loss or processing a loss that even occurred a long time ago. Um, so I have people that will come to see me. They could have lost someone um, significant in their life in the last year, or the last 30 days, um, the last 40 years. I work with a large population of women who lost mothers in their childhood and adolescence. Um, and that's a kind of loss that stays with you throughout their lifetimes. So sometimes the women will come to me 40 years after their mom died and they're really wanting to explore and process how that loss has impacted them um, on, a, on a large identity, identity level, psychological level. So that work, um, all the writing, I speak a lot about grief. I think that grief and loss are something that we need to get better at talking about in our culture. I'm grateful to you for holding this space open so other people can talk about it and think about it. Mm -hmm. Two things come to mind in relation to that. I'll go first to how do you view death? Is it a positive connotation, negative connotation? Is it neutral? Is it a hefty item? What are your thoughts on death? Gosh, all of those? I don't know. It's everything, right? It's um, Some days it just seems like a really natural part of our existence. Some days it does feel heavy. Um, some days I think it's quite beautiful. I think it informs a lot of the rest of our life and how we live it and how we think of ourselves and our time and our relationships. Sometimes it's scary. Um, sometimes I have moments where I, I, I don't want to die or I'm scared to die. Um, and then sometimes I feel really at peace with it. I think it kind of shifts and changes a lot. It's a really interesting time in our culture going through this crisis, you know, where people are really thinking about it more and talking about it more um, in ways that they're usually not open to doing. So that's been interesting. This is a, now I throw out like a pop quiz kind of item. Somebody <laughs> now who's in, let's say New York, because that's the good old epicenter, and their family member was sent away, departed, and now they've exited, they didn't really get an opportunity to end times with them. What are some important things for that person to do? You know, this is happening a lot right now. I'm hearing a lot of stories about people who weren't able to be there bedside, weren't able to say goodbye. They're now grieving in isolation in a tiny apartment in New York. Um, we're losing a lot of opportunities to have our, our regular rituals and customs. People aren't able to have funerals, attend funerals, sit shiva, have wakes. Um, I think that we have to go easy on ourselves as we go through this. We don't have a blueprint for this. We're not used to grieving in this kind of circumstance. Um, not being able to say goodbye to somebody is really difficult. Uh, I think that it can cause some complicated feelings afterwards, feelings of anger, guilt, um, anxiety. So really seeking support. There's a lot of online support out there. There's a lot of people available to talk to. Don't be afraid to look for support with it. It's not an easy thing to go through. I think anything we can do to do rituals at home, to memorialize people at home, to honor them at home, um, until we can have these customs back where we're gathering together and doing the things that we're used to, lighting a candle at night, just anything you can do to spend some time honoring your loved ones will feel better than not doing it. You know, it will feel good. That's true. How much of, this is something that comes to my mind, how much of the weight of someone passing is heavier because of how much was not done as far as interaction during the time they were here that the, comes in the form of guilt when that person is gone for the average person. Yeah, I mean, that's it's definitely gonna be an aspect of right now, but it's, it's a general aspect. You know, I think when we're very rarely prepared to lose someone we love, you know, and there's almost always something we wish we could have done differently or said or done, spent more time with someone. Um, it's not often that I come across someone who feels really clean about everything they did and said and the amount of time they had with their person. There's always more. Um, and so finding ways to acknowledge that, work through some of it, it can be really painful. You know, people can sit with guilt and remorse and frustration and anger for years. Um, sometimes it becomes a way of not dealing with the deeper feelings of sadness. So I think kind of checking in with yourself about that, seeing if um, underneath some of that guilt or anger is just some pure sadness that needs to be felt. It's terribly sad to lose someone we love and to not be able to be there or say goodbye. This one's a, a way I think about things in terms of perspective. When, let's say, one of your creators, let's say your mom passed away, right? Mm -hmm. 
at that time, let's say that is a 10 as far as the anguish connected with it. Mm -hmm. How long does it take before that's maybe like a five manageable and you look at it with like, okay, that was a moment that happened. Gosh, it's different for everyone. Um, that's a big loss. You know, there's some really big losses out there and there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, your age, your developmental capacity for grief, um, your support system around you, your religious or spiritual framework that helps you contextualize it. Um, and then I think active grieving can go on for up to five years. You know, I think that a big loss like that, you will never get over that person. You'll never be like, oh, it's okay that my mom died. I'm fine about it. It's something that's always going to live with you. You'll always wish you could have had more time, but you do stop that kind of active anguish after a period of years. And especially if you're doing the kind of work to sort through some of it, getting some help, talking about them, ritualizing them, um, you know, working through any feelings of guilt that you may have. This one is, uh, do you, over time, did you start to notice, maybe right at the beginning, it's not noticeable. That's with any occurrence in life, usually when it's a momentary thing, we don't pick up things right away. But as time passed, did you notice like, oh, I missed out on this, this information would have been provided to me or this element of guidance. Did you notice things like that along the way? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, I feel like there was just waves and waves of different things, different times when I missed her or mi missed my father, you know, graduating college, um, getting my first big job, writing my first book, getting married, having my first baby, all my babies. Um, many times I've really, really missed them and missed their guidance and been curious about them, too. You know, I was so young when I when they died that um, I wish that I could have gotten to know them as an adult and ask them a lot of questions about their lives and who they were. When someone passes away, it's a nice hit of reality. This virus is a hit of reality. A lot of things in the past two months, I'm seeing more truth than I saw in the past 10 years, which is very nice. Yeah. Um, what parts of reality are most people avoiding who you have interacted with? I think some people are avoiding how hard this is for others, you know, um, which is an interesting thing. I think some people are really like really thinking about that and stepping into the, the drama of it and the trauma and the tragedy. But then there are some people who are dismissing some of, of the difficulties of it. You know, I think um, there's the obvious loss and death and grief that's happening that is really sad and terrible to hear about. But then there's some, you know, there's some form of grief that's happening where people are just alone by themselves and isolated, unable to be around family members and things like that. And I think that, um, I think that that is really difficult for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that some people aren't really recognizing that that much. Right. To go back to the question I just realized that I was back at before that occurred. What do you think you would have still gone in the trajectory of being a therapist had these items not happened to you early on? Did you have a different path prior to that? Um, like I was always a writer. Oh. always a writer. So I was, I started writing when I was really young, maybe eight or nine years old. And, um, and I think, you know, it became a really natural way to cope and to process what I was going through, but I was definitely headed on that path, no matter what, I was always going to be a writer. Um, but I think now I've really seen some interesting overlap between being a therapist and being a writer. You know, it's about storytelling. Um, it's about narrative. When people come into my office, they have a story they tell themselves about who they are, about their loss, about their life. Um, and I think that it's been really helpful to be a writer and to have studied storytelling so much and to really think about the craft of putting narrative together um, and, and then being able to look at how other people are doing that. Because often people have stories that they're telling themselves that aren't always real, don't necessarily work for them, um, aren't healthy. And so to kind of help them pick them apart and maybe rewrite their stories sometimes or edit them um, to be a little more... Um, you know, truthful or helpful in their lives has been a really cool thing to do. The power of storytelling is very compelling. And you made me think of Kobe Bryant. His big thing in the last few years mm -hmm. was storytelling and the power of it. And interestingly enough, I was going to comment on that. When he passed away, in some ways, it was like, wow, this is way too early. He had a whole everything going. But some can look at it with the perspective of he did all his great things and it was the right time in some form. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about that concept that everything sort of fits in some ways and the important things did get across? 
I love that idea. I mean, it's comforting, right? If that were really true, if we could, if it could be proven that, that, um, that it's true that we've accomplished everything we need to in our lifetimes, even when sometimes those times are short. Um, I don't know though. I think it's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, yeah. And <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> oh, no, baby, I'm doing an interview. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think it is super cool. This makes me want to adjust my normal content to its more. Re this is going to adjust things for my future content because I like the reality of it. That's real. And that person who was knocking on the door there might one day write a great dissertation. Who knows? I have no clue. Isn't it interesting where things can go? It's so interesting. I love that everybody's home right now and we're seeing everybody in their home environments and their kids are popping in and we're seeing their living rooms and their home offices. It's, it's very humanizing. Right. We can only connect with human things. People have realized that, especially in recent time, but all those things that were disconnected from our normal ways, they never pulled anybody in. They look nice, but they never, you can't connect with them. They're just a veneer of sorts. The storytelling concept we just mentioned, is there any people's stories who you have followed along that you liked how they presented it or you got insight from their story? Do any people come to mind? Um, I mean, I was just the first person that came to mind randomly was Viktor Frankl, um, okay. Man's Search for Meaning. I mean, I, I think that he really, his work is some of my favorite ever. It's just, I think that the way that we think about how our stories are meaningful, how our lives are meaningful, how our, you know, how big tragedies and traumas and then small moments about our lives, how, how do we make meaning of those things? And we have to make meaning of them. It's, it's how we survive. It's how we move through the world. One thing in each person's life, they have their own story of when things occur. Some people maybe later, they have a family member have an issue. How can they prior to it happening? Because usually someone has a heart attack and then afterwards, everybody's like, oh, we need to adapt. And we didn't know this was going to happen. But what are things people can do uh, years in advance of a family member departing to not have it become a drastic scenario? This is such a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. I think that we just need to be having more conversations all the time, even when we're healthy and young. You know, what, what do you want to happen when you die? What would happen if you got sick? What do you want for our family? What do you want for our life? You know, writing out wills and um, writing out letters to loved ones, um, knowing someone's wishes. That's where I see a lot of angst and turmoil after a loss is when someone doesn't know the wishes. They don't know if someone wanted to be cremated or have a funeral. They don't know what to do with all their stuff. There wasn't anything legally prepared. So there's a whole bunch of crazy work and stuff you have to deal with when you're grieving. It's so hard, you know? So um, I think just having these conversations and letting them be a part of our life is really important. Gaps in communication create the issues and then filling that back in and then the issues can no longer really be there because you're like linked up mentally. Mm -hmm. huh. Is there, do you find, is there a common theme between many of your people you have worked with as far as how they responded to life circumstances or what happened to them? Is there any common themes? Um, you know, I think that one of the common themes with grief and loss is that it really pairs everything down. It makes you really look at everything about yourself, who you are, how you've been living your life up to this point. It's a real mortality check, right? So um, often when you go through a loss, and what, no matter what age you are, it's just that big, great reminder that we're not here forever. And have you done the things you want to do? Are you doing them? Sometimes this can drive people into more guilt and depression because it's so overwhelming, but sometimes it can be really inspiring, you know, and it can just really help you let go of a bunch of things that aren't working for you and to, you know, just really step into your life in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. One thing I just remembered as you were mentioning that was one time I spoke with an individual who I think he's still writing a book on specifically death and it was earlier about death as it connects to photography because he sort of said that a photograph is just a moment and then it's died after that versus uh, in relation to moments of our past are dead. We can't alter them in any form. How do you look at the past and uh, does it bring a positive light to your current day or is it uh, a cold event? 
I think it's good to look at the past. I don't think it's good to dwell in it. I think it's good to let it teach us, you know, to really learn from it, learn from our mistakes, learn from how we've grown. Um, I, I have, my husband calls it an elephant's memory. I remember everything, every detail about everything. Um, and I often will remember where we were a year ago or what was happening last month um, or five years ago. And I think it's very informative in terms of just personal growth. Um, I really think it's, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. For your many offspring, of which there are so many, uh, are you, is there any things you are doing such that if tomorrow somehow something occurred towards yourself or your husband, that it wouldn't impact in the same way? Because that wasn't planned, the earlier on item as well. Do you think yeah. about that? corollary i think about it all the time i've kind of over planned you know i've um put a lot of things in place if something were to happen to me early um you know just basic stuff like life insurance and wills and um all those good things but also i've written letters to my children you know i've really tried to instill a lot of family traditions and teach them things that i hope will carry on through their lives um and i i've i've just been working on that for a long time um, as soon as I became a mom, I had anxiety that I would die young like my parents. And so I've constantly kind of worked to create an environment in which they will be supported and be able to remember things and, and have a sense of family, even if I'm not here. Now, speaking of anxiety that you brought up, which is the title of your book, is, is the main element of anxiety to look at in terms of when it's hefty, like a panic attack? Is it like the day to day where uh, having stress around a certain person like releases cortisol inside your body? How do you think about anxiety? How does it usually manifest in people? Well, I think anxiety is a really underlooked symptom of grief. I think when people go through big grief and loss, again, there's that mortality check, but there's also a certain amount of trauma in losing someone. And um, it's pretty natural that it's, it, that anxiety surfaces. It's um, it's that feeling of uncertainty is one of the big traits of it, you know, and that's what comes with loss is suddenly everything feels uncertain. If that person can die, anything could happen. You know, I could die, I could get sick, someone else I love. Going through that kind of pain and loss is really overwhelming. And I think suddenly starting to worry that you're going to go through more of it um, can be dizzying and just kind of create that that anxiety and that cortisol reaction that just kind of constantly circulates. I've noticed that uh, the most common way it's presented publicly is as far as panic attacks or because that's the loud manifestation of it. And we always look at loud manifestations of things, but not enough usually at the underlying elements that build up to that over time. The chronic is more damaging than the acute I've noticed in life because the acute items are just a moment, but chronic is building and then you mm -hmm. adapt to it and now you have this constant little yeah. bit of stress. But I usually think of it in terms of like stress related to other individual, but I don't usually think of it in terms of grief, this kind of anxiety. How is that different from like stress from a boss or a person you don't get along with? I think it can be a combination of that acute and chronic, you know, I think when you go through a big loss, there's that immediate acute anxiety that surfaces. And then if you don't kind of work on it and start to get it in check or get some support with it, it becomes chronic. You know, I've met people who went through loss 20 years ago and have just developed this chronic anxiety as a result because they never really did anything about it. Um, so it's stressful. I think, you know, anxiety is, can be useful in our lives. It's not always an enemy. Um, it can be scary and overwhelming and insidious, but it's also a useful thing. We use it every day to, to stay prepared for things, to get organized, you know, to stay on top of life. Um, when it becomes insidious and we can't get out from underneath it and it's affecting our day-to-day -day behavior, our relationships, our sense of well-being, that's when we need to work on it. Um, but behavior or anxiety is also really treatable. You know, there's a lot we can do with it. Um, I think that we don't spend enough time really learning how our thoughts work, how our brains work, how we react to things. And in this day and age with just overload of information um, and how much information we're consuming before we're even out of bed in the morning, you know, glance at your phone and the intake you have um, is, is enormous um, and it can cause all kinds of anxiety. And if we're not also balancing that with some healthy, you know, just cognitive work of meditation, mindfulness, like learning how to balance our thoughts and not let them lead us into dark places all the time, then we can get into trouble. 
That's one I like to look at, mental well-being. I always have felt that's one of my strong suits, my mental clarity and well-being. That's been a, a force of nature for many years. How would you compare your current uh, mental well-being to 10 years ago? How has it most altered? Mm, I think that um, I've done so much of this work. I, I really suffered from anxiety myself after my parents died. I had my first panic attack and ended up in an ER after my mom died. Um, and I didn't connect the dots at all. I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought I was having a heart attack or something. And even for a few years, I didn't connect the dots to her, her death um, or those experiences of losing them. And when I finally did, and I started to do this work, I really, I really had to do a lot of meditation, mindfulness, becoming aware of how I was taking in information, how I was letting my thoughts take me down different directions that weren't healthy, um, my ruminating thoughts, all of those things. So I'm in a place now where I can still veer towards anxiety or have an anxious reaction, but then I don't let it continue to influence my behavior or my day. You know, I could take a look at it and do some work around it in order to get back to a healthy place. So I'm generally often in a very healthy place. Um, I don't think it's possible to get rid of anxiety altogether. You know, I don't think we should want to. Again, it's useful in some ways, but we need to learn how to keep it in check. Yes. One thing that comes to mind, what's, what is the value to the individual if they had a scenario that was a panic attack, but they didn't know that's what it was. They just knew it was something off versus knowing that's what this is. How does that help them to know it's at that? Um, I think it's really helpful to know that because underneath anxiety is, is are other things that are causing it, you know, particularly when it's related to grief. Um, so I, I had someone um, come up with the analogy once of, you know, you know, when your car is skidding out on an icy road, you're supposed to turn the wheel into it rather than away from it. And I think anxiety is like that. We need to lean into it. It's like it's like a yellow cautionary light at, a, at an intersection. It's telling us to slow down for a second, take a look around, see what's going on. And anxiety is almost always an indicator of something deeper, something that you're holding on to. Either you haven't processed your grief or you're holding on to some guilt or anger um, or you haven't really sat with that sadness. Um, and doing those things so often really alleviates and, and relieves some of that anxiety. There's a Jay-Z lyric that says, don't run from the pain, go towards it. So mm -hmm. you see the thing, you just, it's not meant for you to be like, oh, I'm going to go around it and go over there. You're supposed to like, that's the whole point is, hello, this is a thing that you left alone for like four months might be good. Exactly. And I, you know, I think it's healthy. That's why at the start of this, when you asked me if I'm the toughest person, I was like, no, I'm the most vulnerable. I do. I lean into that pain because it's, it's what gets me through it. What would you say if I like to do these t one to 10 items, let's say 10 is the most vulnerable a person can be. And one is completely disconnected. I don't know, robotic, some sort of not at all. Mm -hmm. What would you say the average person of our society, where, where do they reside in that? Maybe like a four or five. Mm -hmm. All right. So somewhere in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe it's different from the average, but it is a thing that with the few times you do it, when you're vulnerable, vulnerable, or you disclose information, you are able to connect with people way more readily than had you tried to put on the front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, I think people would be surprised, you know, I think, I think we're often really scared to let our vulnerabilities out and we think people are going to judge us or think we're weak. And then often when you disclose something vulnerable, like oh, I'm having a hard day or I'm going through this, usually other, other people will let their guards down and be like, oh gosh, I've been through that too. Or I can't, I can't believe you're going through that. I'm going through something similar. And I think it's usually very rewarding to do it. That's true. I should pull out some vulnerability here. One, I am in a garage. <laughs> These aren't mountains behind me. <laughs> Two, I like people. I've always liked people. I'm being vulnerable out here. I don't have that many things that are like... Uh... I'm in my car. Um, right. <laughs> I also like people. I'm an extrovert and I really miss hanging out with people. Um, it's, so yeah. It's, you know the Myers-Briggs system? Mm -hmm. yeah. In that, I'm an ENTP. So I have that, that end of it. I don't know if you know the letters. I'm an but... ENFJ, I think. Oh. Uh, what I know of ENFJs, including a few of my friends who are that, they are socially harmonious. They like everyone to get along in a group. And sometimes they have maybe a, like a activism or a political kind of let's get together and mm -hmm. group. And then uh, they like to take a, into account everybody in the group sort of thing. 
they're mm. warm yes that's a cool thing mine is more like a kind of a scientific and poking at things mm -hmm. and kind of comedian sort of that combination a little bit which is good it's Different a good styles. one yeah mm -hmm. And slightly extrovert. Right now, the extroverts of our society, there's a little bit of a, you can't do all the things as normal. Mm -hmm. It's disconnected, if you will. What has been, aside from, is there, oh, this is a good one. If you have such hefty events early on in life, maybe not the toughness connected to that or the vulnerability, but does everything else look lighter or easier in comparison? Like, what's an example? Like, if tomorrow you wanted to start some sort of new business venture or um, try out a risk, a travel something idea that you wouldn't have done previous, like, does it lead to more of, I might as well do it, this is nothing compared to what happened early yes, on in life? Definitely. It's a, I'm, I'm very adventurous. I'm up for trying anything. I'm not afraid to fail because I feel like the bottom has already fallen out of my life before, you know, I'm just really not, I'm not afraid for it to happen again that much. And I'm also, nothing can really compare. So, um, it, but it's fun. It's been a really cool aspect. I've just done so many wild things that have been really um, fruitful in my life. And um, yeah. That's cool. One thing I like to check, I know I mentioned uh, a book. Is there any, what social media do you most connect with? Is it like text-based style, audio, videos? How do you usually take in information to learn or see new things? Um, I read tons of books. Um, I read a lot of news on my phone. Um, I like Instagram a lot. I'm on there and I like, um, I like photos and kind of stories that go with them. Um, so yeah. That's fair. Variety. I usually like to go more uh, text is my main mm -hmm. category. That's wonderful. One thing I always like to check is if you had a message, a megaphone to all people of the earth, what is something you would want them to know about whether it is grief or well-being, a message you would want to tell all 7.8 billion people on the planet? What might that be? Um, I would want to tell them to go easier on themselves. I feel like we're so hard on ourselves as humans. Um, we put so many expectations on ourselves to be perfect, to know how to do things, to be strong. It is not easy to be a human being. I tell my daughters this all the time. It's hard to be a human being in the world. It's not easy. There's not often a perfect role model or a blueprint for what you're going through. Um, and it's, there's a lot of emotions and it can be messy. But I think leaning into that is, uh, is really beautiful. It's a warm message. <laughs> Claire, I would like to thank you for having been on this wonderful episode of the show. Thank you for having me. You know it, and we are out.